you have to always be on point with your easy and medium difficulty questions if you mess those up then your adaptive score is going to get messed up from a really beginning point as well so if people are struggling with stories i would suggest them to introspect on how each and every bullet point in their resume actually happened ask yourself questions as to why did i get into this project what was the initial state of the project how did the project go about what decisions did i have to take in the middle of this project Welcome to another episode of Crack the MBA show. Our guest today is Vivek Verma, who is a second year student at University of Michigan's Ross School of Business. Vivek graduated from UPES with a BTech in Applied Petroleum Engineering. Thereafter, Vivek worked at the intersection of energy, finance and technology at Royal Dutch Shell as a data engineer and senior business analyst for almost 5 years. At Ross, Vivek is president of Indian Subcontinent Business Association. international chair open road fellow mtrek lead member of ross police contributor to business beyond usual podcast and winner of evi consulting case competition in the summer after first year vivek pursued an internship with lk consulting in boston welcome vivek thank you so much for joining us thank you nupur thanks for the opportunity as well Yeah, it's such a pleasure. Amazing, <laughs> Vivek. Like you have so many activities that you've been a part of. I was just wondering how you get everything done, and I'm sure we'll get an opportunity to chat about that later. So I would say I put my fingers in a lot of pies in the first year. Then I realized it's not how it works in MBA, and you got to really prioritize. So I actually pulled back on a few elements, but I was really persistent about what I thought I really really wanted to do so I stuck out with them such as the Indian club or the open road or different elements that really compel me to join Ross so I stuck with them pulled back on a few elements and trying to still gain new experiences in the second year as well try out a few things I did not do in the first year so it's just a trial and error process that's been going on so far <laughs> fair fair yeah it's it's short right the time that you have in yeah. you want to be a part of each and everything you want to grow and expand your exactly. presence yeah. as well but yeah at the same time you want to find that balance so i can completely understand your conundrum all right amazing it would be wonderful if you could share a fun fact about yourself you know get the audience to know about you a little bit on a personal level as well This actually takes me back to this Duke essay, which asks you like twenty five fun facts about yourself. But <laughs> just thinking about it, I would say that in high school I was a national level quizzer. This is back in two thousand eight to ten. That time frame when my state of Telangana was still part of Andhra Pradesh, so I represented my school in the national level. Won a few stuff there, but. used to be quizzed by Derek O'Brien and Big Brain pretty big quiz masters then yeah i was a national level quizzer and i almost got put into a south indian movie a telugu movie when as the child artist you know playing the young role of a big actor so i was pulled in to do a talk when i was in school in one of the tv channels where they were asking students about corporal punishment and some director saw me speak and they wanted to cast in their film and he was a big director but my parents didn't agree right <laughs> but i'm here today so i guess uh, things moved in the right direction oh wow wonderful so we have a hero in our midst that's pretty exciting <laughs> super rubbing shoulders with the likes of derek o'brien that's pretty impressive as well i've seen a lot of candidates from india have a passion for quizzing you know even in engineering school and what not yes and we don't see as much of that at the mba level for some reason you know there's not as many opportunities for quizzing do you have any thoughts on that do, do you know why that is there's a few elements i feel in high school which are quite different in the american system and the indian system in the american system i feel sports is so such a big thing that every kid is into something or the other and if not sports they're into some playing a musical instrument i don't think it's that big in our space we're still really academically driven maybe it's through culture or just uh, cultural aspects of it and which is why i think quizzing is a more natural tangent for a student to still diversify a bit but still stay close to the intellectual aspect while i feel in the american system at least there is a lot more options you can't just be a quizzer you can go into an instrument you can go into spelling bee which is usually won by indians but you know play a musical instrument do the a cappella whatever so i feel 
it's probably due to a result of that yeah that is possibly where my thoughts are right now on that yeah that's a great point i didn't think about it this way but now that you say it uh, it logically makes a ton of sense super so vivek it would be really nice if you could share some of your winning habits you know that have led to your successes in various areas including securing a job with shell securing admission to ross your summer internship yeah including one in italy as well so just all these things you've done you also talked about how you had an opportunity to work as a child artist which your parents didn't allow so what i'm also hearing is maybe there was a focus and discipline so would love to hear about that maybe just on the second point that you mentioned as every indian kid or a guy or a boy growing up you first want to be a cricketer and then you want to like diversify a bit so i wanted to be an air force pilot and then i had glasses for like 10 years so that didn't happen then i was like okay let's be a diplomat i think i'd be a great diplomat i think i have all the skills to be a great diplomat that didn't work out and then i went into mba but coming on to winning habits i would say i have to recognize firstly that i'm quite privileged in a way that i'm not like from a well off well off family but i think when you look at the mba sphere all of us come from a really similar bracket of background we're not too much in the extremes as what i've noticed at least with the people i've met in across all the schools and not just across so i have to recognize that i've been privileged and had the opportunities to have a good high school education at one of the best schools in india then have the opportunities to actually tell my parents so i want to do an mba and such so that would actually be a context for my winning habits because as i mentioned i was a quizzer and once you start quizzing and what you really start to feel is the more you learn the more you feel you don't know about it because there are so much more in that subject there are so many things which connect into one subject so many topics are intertwined and interconnected so i think i really started being really humble from a really young age due to quizzing and just being a good listener and an observer i was not a speaker even then so i think that just humbled me down and kind of pushed me into a space where i started introspecting from a really young age like what are my strengths what are my weaknesses and i would say my winning habits are all based off on that because i try to put myself out there i try to put my hand up for activities or initiatives where i feel i can make a difference where i can feel i can make an impact and the spaces where i know i'm a little weak which are not my stronger points i still try to put myself out there in spaces where i can improve myself but not be out there where you're really really putting yourself in the glare of everyone so i think i've always tried to maintain that balance even in the same in uh, pre mba as well during my work as well during my education even my application and post time during my mba life as well and it's an ongoing process and really trying to understand what are my strengths how is it developing am i good here just being honest with yourself where you stand with the pool and i think you can get into a space where you're really discounting yourself from the quality of your who you're competing with as well but i think it's more of maintaining that balance of a healthy optimism but at the same time a good humble sense of attitude which lets you know that okay there's so much more to learn going forward and i think that has always been the value at system at least that i've had for all my successes and even all my failures as well Okay, that's really helpful, Vivek. I want to double click on something that you said, right? You talked about how you're somebody who always puts his hands up for activities or initiatives. Yeah. Can you make it more real for us and maybe give a small example of you having done that in your pre-MBA life? I feel I've always had the little leadership element in me from a really young age. And when I say leader, I don't essentially mean you have to be in a formal role to be a leader you can it's about taking the leadership in that moment and it could be a small thing such as you're you're at work you're at a team meeting everyone's looking around because a manager has asked the team to go forward and do something and what i've noticed is it's usually people put it off to someone else they're like oh yeah okay, we can do that we can do this we can do that but no one's going to say i can lead that or i will make you do that or i will help you with that so i think the i element is missing and i've noticed that pre mb and even during mba it's really funny that way and i think i've always had this element of okay instead of saying let's do that i'd rather say okay i can help you with that and then you'd have other team members putting their hands up and saying yeah i can help you with this on whatever he wants to do i think it's just those really simple elements which which let your teammates know subconsciously that that is a person we'd love to work with that is a person we know will take the mantle or take the initiative in such moments i think it's really those moments and even during mba i'm thinking i think it's an ongoing process and this is where i guess the group projects the group element of ross comes in is you've got five people everyone's like okay what are we going to do 
and then it's as simple as saying okay guys let's just put our heads together and let's just prioritize what we want to do and then we can distribute it among ourselves and what not so i think it comes out in the small elements as well which translate in the bigger moments it gives you the courage to put your hand up for the bigger moments the bigger projects the bigger assignments yeah okay no that's really deep and really helpful i especially like the point you talked about where it signals to the team that this is a person that we'd love to work with that's really amazing uh, thanks vivek okay so vivek would love to chat about admissions related aspects right if you could share a little bit about how long you spent on different components of your application uh, from tests essays networking it'll be really helpful interview prep So just for the benefit of the viewers I am class of 2024 which means I joined my school in 2022 August which means I had to go through 2021 with my applications the second half of 2021 but I always felt my road would lead to an MBA so I was always aware of what the concept of an MBA was so even from late 2020 itself which is 2 years before my class starts I was researching into MBA the concept of an MBA what options I had so I was looking into the standard like every indian student does the ncerts or the nsus or the ones in singapore the ones in europe and the ones in america then the isb asking yourself if you want to give the cat again so i was in that phase started off from 2020 late 2021 itself i was researching day in day out on watching podcasts like the one we're doing or sitting on gmat club sitting on reddit all these mba forums trying to understand what are the requirements for an mba how do schools rank do rankings even matter and what do you look more than just the rankings all these elements that you come across during applications so i started very early in that way i started my gmat preparation as well in 2020 2021 itself this 2020 itself the second half of covid the year of covid when it was just opening up so i knew i wanted to do an mba because covid was happening and i was like i want to change it's been sitting in house for too much and i want to get back into the classroom environment and just learn so i started my gmat preparation from the 2020 october or so sat down for 3 months gave my first attempt in 2021 january that was okay i was not happy with it it was a 720 or so but i felt i could do better then i said okay let's take a break for a few months because i felt i was getting burnt out and my work pressure on the work side was also increasing. reason then so i took a break for a few months maybe for like 5 6 months and i started again from july or so i sat down for another 3 months and worked on what elements i had done poorly in my first attempt and i finished my second gmat attempt by 2021 august so my exam was done so i could next work on all my other aspects of the application the essays recommendation letters the just networking with the students and such so it was in context a long process but the meat of my preparation was a space of like 4 5 months in the second half of 2021 and that was when i believe was the biggest difference for me but the foundation was laid from a year ago itself for me understood and with regard to the gmat you mentioned that you focused on your weak areas right how did exactly did you go about your preparation did you participate in a prep program how do you recommend people go about it and for context i believe you scored a 770 on your final attempt right yes when an applicant sits down and wants to prepare for the gmat the number of questions firstly you want you try to familiarize yourself with the pattern of the exam that is an adaptive exam that now it's given online as well etc etc the next element is what books do i go to what resources do i go towards i had really research on that subject and i really honed in on the aspect that i wanted to just stick with one proper book or resource for each topic area i didn't want to diversify myself with different uh, the manhattan or something else i didn't want to diverse from myself that much so for sc i stuck with one one book for rc i stuck with one book for critical reasoning i stuck with one book and so i wanted to just be definite in what i was preparing with i wanted to be completely sure with whatever topic i was researching for each subject and which books were you using for each subject so i think i started with aristotle 99 i believe for reading comprehension for the sentence correction i believe it is the manhattan prep one book of the manhattan prep i believe is what i used for sentence correction critical reasoning was largely gmat club 
I think they have a great repository. And for Quant, I believe it was largely GMAT Club itself because Quant was something we were already aware about being an Indian student, at least from a technical education. So I did not believe that I needed to get up to speed from the basics. I just had to like practice the easy mediums and the hard. So once I was able to identify which books I wanted to go for with each subject, I sat down, I gave my mock attempt. I think that's what it's called, mock one. Before you start your prep, it was like a 660, 670. I was like, okay, cool, but I guess a good start. Then I realized that once I started the prep that my sentence correction was really, really weak. I was speaking English from a really young age, but staying in the Indian climate, you start to get into a mix of English plus your Hindi or English plus your other languages that you have, which was Telugu for me. So I had to really zone in for the fact that I should be actually put down my formal English properly for the first time. So I was like, okay, my essay is weak. What do I do now? Then I started to tactically understand each and every rule of the sentence correction. I knew this was weak. I didn't just gloss over it. I sat down and read each and every page. Once I read a concept, I used to give all the low. So GMAT Club is classified, I believe, as low, medium and high difficulty. The question bank in GMAT Club. So I used to give all attempts for the low difficulty questions. On the RC and the CR side, I believe that if you do your CR well, your RC becomes good enough as well because the concepts are really the same. To interpret the reading comprehension of the passage, your critical reasoning has to be good. My first priority then was critical reasoning and RC was something I took up in the later half of my preparation. So it was just critical reasoning and just quant. These two elements, I really, really honed in on them. I used to just give the attempts for low and medium always, just staying a little above the 700 level because I knew that GMAT was adaptive, which meant that you had to always be on on point with your easy and medium difficulty questions. If you mess those up, then your adaptive score is going to get messed up from a really beginning point as well. So I used to sit down and just keep giving questions after questions. Every day I used to give like maybe 40 sentence correction questions, 20 CR questions. CR is really bulky, right? So I couldn't give 40 questions daily. So I used to give like a breakdown of 40 and 20. Once I realized that my CR was very good and it naturally started improving because I did have a reading habit as well. Then I think the RC was automatic because I didn't even prepare, to be honest. It was just a natural tangent or a natural benefit of what I did in CR. Okay, that's super helpful. So what I'm also hearing is you didn't necessarily participate in any formal coaching. You were doing bits and pieces from different places. For quant, I did take up, I think, a month subscription for the target test prep because I wanted to do a few mocks and I just tried out the TTP, I believe is what it is called. That is great, but I still think the GMAT Club is a great resource. They've got fantastic contributors who like put a chunk for RC, what you need to study for RC, what you need to study for CR and section wise contributions and I think just going through those links is more than enough because if you tend to get into so many resources you can get confused you're like studying one book for one day studying the second book for another day and I think that at least was not helpful for me yeah no that makes a lot of sense okay so when it comes to the other components of your application Vivek uh, the essays the interviews recommendations can you give us a sense for how long you were spending on the other components important thing to me was recommendation and not the essays first because I had to let senior ups in my firm know that this is what I want to do moving forward and leave the firm. Not a great thing to actually share in a candid way, but I wanted to do that. I had a great performance during COVID during work, but they did know that I did have interest outside work. I wanted to diversify self, my skill set more. So I did share with them in late 2021 itself that I was thinking about doing a higher education, potentially an MBA and kept my both the managers in the loop about it. And they were quite cool with it. At the same time, they were also offering me possible promotions in different areas to like keep me in the firm. But I was like, let's think about it a few months down the line. Like, I don't want to like get selfish here or get greedy here. So because my managers are already aligned with that, I think it was easy for me to approach who I wanted for my recommendation letters. So I was really targeted about that. I had a great work experience with so-and-so colleague and I approached them about my aspirations and they were quite supportive about it. So approached two people and it was essentially the same recommenders who were giving my letters for all the applications. So I started early with that aspect. The next was the essay. So once I finished my GMAT in like second attempt in like August, I started off with my essays and so I was largely targeting round twos because I feel I had missed the boat for round one by then. So I was networking and with different ambassadors and etc. attending different events. I was trying to work on my essays and I did take 
help of one admissions consultant for my essays for ISB at least. So ISB was my first application and I did take help for them for one application. And then I believed that I was in a good spot, but I knew the direction of how I wanted to go with my other essays. So I started writing my own essays again for all the other schools. And I used to go on Fiverr and have my essays proofread by someone or the other there, which is ensure my grammar was in place and the tone of my essays were in place. So that was also not a long process for me. It was probably a process of two, three months. I guess then we come on to the resume. So the resume, I believe, was okay. I was working. I had never worked on my resume because I had stuck on being in the same firm for like four, five years, but I had to work on it for like a few weeks as well. Looking back at it now, it's like vastly different how my resume of Vivek Verma is now compared to what it was two years ago. MBA really pushes you in that aspect. Like it really polishes those elements, but I believe it was also an effort of two, three weeks for me, the resume as well, but it was all happening in parallel. The networking with schools, the essays, the resume was all happening in parallel for me. Understood. And once you had interview invites, what kind of time did you allocate or what kind of time do you recommend people allocate? Because I guess a lot of times after you apply, interviews start trickling in and that's when you realize, oh, I, I have to prepare. But is that a wise strategy or do you recommend another approach? In my context, I was actually called in for the round two of ISB before all the other schools. And that was pretty much early in the process. And I had not given an interview till then. So I sat down for a mock interview with one of the ISB alumni because I wanted to be like, I want to be comfortable with the interview aspect of ISB is what I thought. I left out the US schools away for a while and I got killed in the first interview. I mean, the interview was really, really put me through a stress in the first interview itself. Self, in my first mock interview, put me through a mock case itself in the first interview because I mentioned that I want to get into consulting. So there's, there was a kind of like a difficult market sizing question. Until then, I never knew what market sizing was. I had not got into market sizing. So I got absolutely killed and I was like, oh my God, what, I, what do I do now? And all my interviews are going to come. But then I sat down, I started working on the feedback he had given me. He had mentioned that you need to research a little more about the industries that you want to end up in, which are pertaining to your short and long-term goals. So sat and uh, researched about that for a week till I was intellectually comfortable to have a conversation with anyone. I put myself through a couple of market sizing exercises just so that I'm comfortable with if any element like this does come up. And I had another mock interview with the admissions consultant who I was working with for ISB by then. I had a couple of interviews and then I sat down for my first ISB interview. That went well. Then I got the confidence that, okay, I hope interviews for the USB schools are not so different. Turns out they're actually much more easy. This is what I realized when I sat through for like six, seven interviews with the USB schools. I think it kind of became easy for me after giving two to three mock interviews. And I would suggest that to anyone. And it's even more important once we're in the MBA, how important mock interviews are. But I would suggest anyone who's looking into MBA applications to like give three, four mock interviews so you're comfortable with the aspect also wherein and any question can just boomerang and come and hit you in the face. Yeah, three, four interviews, I think would help before you give your first official college school interview. Okay, that's a very helpful tip, Vivek. And a lot of people do have consulting as their immediate post MBA goal. You talked about preparing cases, almost that's what it sounded like, at least. So how can candidates prepare to address those cases if they have no idea how cases are handled? Right. Firstly, it's true that a large part of the applicant pool wants to get into consulting. And secondly, I think just taking it off that point, then it would make more sense. And through my experiences, I've realized as well to make yourself comfortable with the industries that you want to end up in consulting. So when people write the short term goal essays or so, I think we should be particular about the industry we want to end up in even in consulting. And at least I did that. I was really focused on that aspect. So I wanted to be in the energy space space and the social impact space and the sustainable transition phase. So I had to be more comfortable with where the industry was going in those areas. And I think once you're comfortable with that aspect, then I think it answers the first question that you put to me, like, how can you be comfortable with the consulting aspect of the MBA interviews? Coming to the market sizing, which I got in my mock interview, I think that was just, just a surprise element because I have not seen or heard about it in either my interviews or the interviews of my colleagues and friends. I think that was just a way to put me off my balance. But if anyone wants to try that, I think it is a good primer for them once they get into B schools and start B school internship recruiting as well. It's a natural element where you're market sizing and going through those exercises. But I don't think it's important. I would rather 
suggest that be comfortable with your short term goal be comfortable with your long term goal and be comfortable with the industries which are involved in your short and long term goals and i think those are more than enough is what i feel okay and i have a follow up question about something that you said you said that even within consulting you recommend specifying the industry uh, one would like to be involved with my question is many consulting firms recruit candidates as generalists right so how can one specify the industry when they will essentially be starting out as a generalist like maybe you could shed some light on that yes so i think just to preface that it does not matter what short term or long term goal you come up with once you get into the b school not to everyone it does not matter you can do a complete 180 and get into ib after saying consulting 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 and nobody will give a hoot about it. but coming to your question again i think the role that you get recruited across all the consulting firms is usually at a level below the manager and once you like two and a half to four years in the firm you get into the role of the manager or the team leadership while running cases and leading multiple cases the firm expects you to put your hand up and say i want to specialize in so and so industry anyway so that is your four roughly 3.5 years or four years from the day you graduate i think you still have to put your hand up and say this is my specialization or at least the firm expects you to and in my purview when you ask me for a short term goal i think it is usually five years down the line and for me five years down the line is five years after i graduate so which is why I I felt that I had to be more focused on the industry that I wanted to end up in consulting. Yes, I think most firms do take in as generalists. I think that is completely 100% correct, but I wanted to just be more particular about it because then I could also connect the dots for my long-term goal much more easily once I was comfortable with the short-term aspect. That was my rationale when I came up with it. Yes. understood so starting out as a generalist then say about 3 and a half 4 years specializing and then long term goal yes. about 7 10 odd years something like that yeah okay very helpful uh, vivek in your view what is the evaluation rubric followed by ross's admissions committee i believe at least sitting through the being an ambassador and speaking with the admissions committee that the intake criteria is largely similar across most of the schools i think there's no different element as such for every school but for ross what we really look into is firstly less is more so you have to be really targeted in your essay that we have for like 400 words that is one using the limited real estate well and secondly i believe it is showing more of a collective a personality or a humble personality where so let me just take a tangent here university of michigan draws is a really really big about football for example and that infuses into every aspect of the school as well not just in the business school but in all of the schools there's a lot of we attitude in us the students are allowed to be leaders for example the, the campus governance committee is really really strong here so there's a lot of initiative taking and there's a lot of the we in that any school of michigan looks for and ross is much more targeted at that so you still have to come across as a confident and a capable leader but at the same time come across also as a leader. leader who emphasizes the we more than an i and i think that is a little delicate balance to maintain because in b school applications and even after you get into a b school you're asked to emphasize the i more than the we but it does show through your personality it does show through your stories as well when you're trying to maintain that balance of the we and the i and i think ross really goes hard for that as in they're really, really looking for candidates who can put that balance across who because if you get in too much of the i there's a tendency that you can deviate the team and take it and get into your biases or be a little more selfish in what you're pursuing so there still has to be a healthy balance of we when you're in a team so i think that is what ross looks largely for and of course like any other b school they do look for impact in whatever role that you've been in prior to mba does not need to be at a t2 firm to get into ross here whichever role you've performed either at a non profit either at a mnc or either at a startup as long as you've had impact i think that is something ross really looks for and again every other top b school pretty much looks for understood Vivek you said something which is crucial right that you have to use the 400 words available really well so i would love to better understand how candidates can go about making an impact in fewer words and if you can also share an example of maybe one of your stories that you were able to use in your application to shine that'll be even amazing yes i'm just trying to recollect what my prompts were in 2021 i believe it was more on i believe we had like options of six prompts in two different buckets three prompts in bucket 1 three prompts in bucket 2 
and we had to like pick one from bucket one and pick one from bucket two and what i rather did was i had already mapped a few stories seven to eight stories by then and i tried to map it to each question or each prompt each of the six prompts that was provided and trying to understand which prompt and story had a really good fit and i think that is something again i suggest for everyone looking into ross to do that then you can identify which are your strongest combinations and once you're able to pick that then comes the next aspect of showing it in the limited word space that we have i would suggest maybe candidates to separate the essay into two halves let me just take an example of one prompt that we had i made a difference when i think that was one of the prompt like right? you have to start the essay with i made a difference when so i believe one of my story mapped well to it it was an experience which was during work but not directly attached to my work what i was getting paid for so i believed it was still in that nice balance of co curricular initiative taking but at the same time this was still in the corporate space so i was comfortable with that and i mentioned about high led initiative to reduce the food wastage in our office campus through a couple of initiatives so i think then the candidates have to be really succinct about what initiatives they took maybe mention a couple points around what was the thought process behind and why did they put their hand up and let the initiative then what made them or compelled them to say okay let me do this initiative and i think maybe add a couple of points around that add a couple of points around what you actually did add a couple of points around what the impact of of the action was and also a couple of points around what the initial state was like why did you even feel that you had to make a difference in this space and then just trying to weaving it around with some good grammar or good structure good english maybe use chat gpt or what not i don't know what's the norm now but just trying to weave all that together i think that forms a really good foundation block and after that it's just adding more of your flair or more of the intricacies of your story i think that's what will make you stand out and not sure what my second prompt was i think it was around conflict resolution or mostly rather around i had a difficult time when or something along those lines and i already had an experience at my firm during work when i had to push through and persuade a couple of senior leaders for an enterprise wide activity that we had so i was able to fit that into my story that hey listen this is a situation that i was in it was really difficult for me the situation so this these are the couple of steps i took and this is the rationale behind why i took these steps and this is how it translated into so much or so impact or made what sort of difference it make i think these are both the stories i went in with and worked out for me so i would suggest candidates to maybe have a bank of maybe six seven stories for ross at least try to map it to each and every prompt try to find a nice combination and then just put those foundation block in and then just like try to bring your personality out of it if you can Yeah that's really helpful Vivek thanks for walking us through your process you talked about having six or seven stories right how do you recommend candidates go about identifying those anecdotes maybe if you have any advice there right so at least for the mba because the b school application still allows you to go back in the past and bring out stories from your high school university i was still able to bring a couple of stories from there and i was also able to bring out a couple of stories from the resume points that you usually have so if people are struggling with stories i would suggest them to introspect on how each and every bullet point in their resume actually happened ask yourself questions as to why did i get into this project what was the initial state of the project how did the project go about what decisions did i have to take in the middle of this project did i have any difficulties how was my team like how were my colleagues senior colleagues or stakeholders like and what was the impact of this project was i was able to complete it can i quantify it if i can't quantify it how can i translate and still show the impact that this was still a worthwhile time for me to do so i think if someone is struggling with stories i would suggest just sit through each and every bullet point and ask yourself what story comes out of each each bullet point and i think i use that for a couple of stories for myself and that really helped for me that should give you roughly four to five stories i believe and then otherwise it just depends on the kinds of projects that you've had if you've had a transition going from one role to another that is a story in itself as well i think it is very individualistic this question so at least i did not have that much of a difficult time because i was targeted in what i wanted to do and i knew what i was getting into yeah i really like the resume tip you provided to mine some of those stories vivek let's talk a little bit about 
your interview experience as well. Can you talk about your Ross interview experience and share advice that you have for candidates to excel in the interview? I think I mentioned it before that the US B school interviews are kind of easy compared to at least the ISB interview experience. And if people sit through the IAMs compared to that as well. So essentially, it's usually taken by an alum or taken by a second year student or taken by someone in the admissions committee. So it's usually one of these three groups. Most of my interviews for the other schools were taken by alums of those schools, some even 23rd alums of the school had graduated 15 to 20 years ago. But my Ross interview was taken by second year MBA student. And the questions, again, not just for Ross, but all the interviews were largely similar. And I think candidates have to really, really be comfortable with those questions, which are, why do you need an MBA now? Can you still do this or reach a short term goal without an MBA? So I think that brings out why do you need an MBA? Once you're able to do that, what's your short term goal? What's your long term goal? What would you do if not for an MBA? And after that, it's one of the most important questions is why this school and why not any other school? I think if you're comfortable with these questions, you will largely see just these questions in all of your interviews. After that, trial and error where you're getting comfortable with the interview process, getting comfortable with the virtual experience, maybe if that is new for a few people and so. So the interview was not that difficult for me across any school or Ross. And also at Ross, I think it was helpful to bring out what I really liked about Ross. So what elements are really connected with, how I networked and how I saw myself contributing to the community once I joined the B school. I think that was something I was able to really bring out in my answers, like really show that this is what I want to do. Yeah, these are the activities I will put my hand up for. These are the initiatives I want to be a part of. And I think be comfortable with that aspect would also help me quite a bit. Okay, understood. Since you're involved with interviews, what are some key mistakes you see candidates making in interviews? So someone gave me this nice comparison where they said interviews are more like kind of like dating. So you have to make the other person or the, the school or the interviewer make them feel special essentially. So you've got to tell them why they stand out for you. Just taking a step back, the biggest mistake they make is using answers which can fit for any school. So why do you like Ross? Oh, I'm giving the same reasons why I like Duke or Haas or whatever. And the same element comes out during your internship recruiting as well, full-time recruiting as well, where every firm wants to know why you're interested in them, why do they stand out for you and whatnot. So coming in with that mindset, I think would help students a bit, but they make a lot of mistakes. Most of the mistakes students make or applicants make is in these elements. That you're not essentially letting the other person know why they stand out for you. And making an effort there would go long distance is what I personally feel. Understood. And personalizing your answers for the school and showing how you've engaged, those are probably some ways that they can do that. Yeah. Okay, fair. Vivek, what weaknesses in your candidacy did you successfully overcome through the application process and how? Just before that, I believe the MBA application process is a set of like six, seven components, which are all looked at holistically. So I believe they are looked at holistically. So your GMAT score, your prior education, your work ex, your recommendation letters, your essays, messages a couple more elements here but I'm sure people who are looking at this will know what those six seven elements are then identifying what are your strong elements what are your weak elements what can you do to make up for those weak elements in the Indian context at least they call these as spikes so how many spikes do you have in your six seven elements what can you do to make up for those spikes and whatnot I felt my overall candidacy was very strong I had good decent amount of international exposure international experience leadership it was good mix it the ideal mix for an MBA student but I believe what helped me back was that in my transcript, one of my subjects has an asterisk wherein I flunked one subject once and I had to like retake it again. So that I felt, oh, maybe this will hold me back a bit. And maybe I'm not from the tier one or the tier two engineering uh, schools because one day as a 17 year old, my exam didn't go well. So I'm making up for it. Or how do I make up for it four or five years later now? So these are the questions that I had. I was open about what my weakness were then. So that is when I realized that, okay, to make up for my undergrad or whatnot, I have to like come up with a really good GMAT score, which is why I felt 720 is not enough, which is why I felt 740 is not enough, even though that is usually the range that Indian students have when they get into any school. So uh, I was like, okay, I think I can do better because I'm, that is what I felt. So that's when I felt, okay, maybe the 770 will make up for the weak elements in my candidacy. 
So that was one aspect. When you look back at all these six, seven components, there's only a few aspects you can change in the last moment. The GMAT score is one, which you can still improve. You can't change your work X anymore. That's already in the past, which is why I gave my GMAT again, got a 770. I was like comfortable. Okay, 99 percentile should be in a good spot. Work X you couldn't change. LORs, yes, you can fine tune them. And I was confident there as well. Essay, yes, I was confident. The resume, okay, it was not polished because the resumes are always vastly different when you exit an MBA and enter an MBA. So then I felt confident, but now I feel that was just, I don't know what it was then. So I was able to identify what my weaknesses were and then try to make those last minute improvements. That would essentially be my answer. Yes. Understood. Thanks for sharing that so authentically, Vivek. I have seen candidates who have had to repeat courses. They plunk them. So any advice there? Do you recommend that people explain that in the optional essay or anything else that you'd share there? Yes, I think usually every school asks for like two essays or three essays. But if you're able to use your optional well, that becomes another element of your candidacy, which you can show through. So you have to use the negative as a positive is what I feel here. And that is a good space, actually. The optional people think is usually used to like cover up for your negatives, cover up for a weakness in your application, say, this is what happened and this is my explanation for it. Rather, how I use my optional was I tried to explain my weaknesses as everyone does, but I tried to put it in a positive light as well. How I I've improved or how the experience was beneficial for me in a way because failures are also important for your for your growth as an individual and as a profession. So I was able to really show through that through my optionals. And I believe when a school asked for two essays, then it became three essays for me. And I was able to show an additional element of my candidacy, which the other two essays didn't touch about. So if the first essay touched about one experience at the firm and the second experience touched about an experience which was at work, but not exactly at work, as I mentioned previously, the third optional was able to bring out an another aspect of my growth or my individuality, which the other two didn't touch upon. So then you're able to bring out conflict resolution, you're able to bring out persuasion, you're able to bring out team building, and you're still bringing out individual growth. So I think, or at least I believe I use that in a positive frame. And I would also suggest students to think, to introspect that if they have a weak element in their resume and they want to explain it, then go forward, but try to not show it as an excuse, but try to show how you've grown from that experience instead. Understood. Vivek, once you were admitted to Ross, how did you navigate the process of availing a loan? You know, what vendors did you consider and how did you ultimately choose the company that you wanted to avail a loan from? So again, you've got limited options for any B-School student. So it's either your personal funds or you have to go through a lender from the US geographical region. And once you're considering that, then it's also about do you have a relative or a close relative who can like vouch for you so that you can get a lower interest rate or do you need to go with sorts of discover or so where you're getting the higher interest because you've got no co-signer. And the second option, I believe, is you can go take forward with a loan from one of the Indian banks. So these are the two options that I had. Most of my peers went with the Discovers and most of the lenders in the US space. But I went ahead with one of the banks in India because I believe that it would be easier for me to pay down the loan because the US dollar was appreciating every year against the Indian rupee. So at least the trends were showing that and I believed the gap between both would only grow further in the next five years, that is two years of study and three, four years of work, it would be easier for me to pay down my loan, I believe, in a much quicker way if I earned in the USD and paid down my INR. So I went forward with a loan with one of the Indian lenders. And most banks do offer loans for top B schools. They're quite open about it. They might have a limit based on putting up as your collateral, but they're usually pretty open about it. They're comfortable, especially if you get into a top B school. I'm not sure how the space is shaping up in the US lending space now, because I just heard a couple of days ago that Discover was selling off their loan portfolio and they were seeking someone to buy their loan portfolio or the student loan portfolio. I'm not sure if Discover might be an option this year for students as it was for peers from my batch. So yeah, just keep your options open. If possible, try to get scholarships. And this is when I would suggest also students to take the decision of maybe go going down the prestige a bit. It's not the right word, but that's how it's shown in the MBA context. So be comfortable with going down a couple of from your first priority if it makes your financial capacity easier. Because after a level, I feel you're still competing for the same
same roles as the other student from another school. And I believe at least except Harvard, Stanford and Wharton, I feel all the other schools are largely in the same dimension and not like the ranking show. And even with the Wharton students as well, I was competing with the same roles. I was friends with a couple of Wharton colleagues during my interns who were at other firms. So we were in the same space. So if it helps you, I would suggest students to actually just go down to a second priority or third priority schools if it makes their financial package easier. Okay, understood. And just to follow up on the loans from the Indian banks, would you have a sense for how much money they're willing to sponsor generally? The highest limit, I believe, is one crore. I don't think they'll go above that. I mean, this is the most trickiest aspect is what I feel. like. One crore, if you're going in without a loan, is not enough to get through your MBA experience. It's important to have other sources of funds for this, personal or family or something else. Worst case, there's always US lenders, but you're going to be charged a higher interest rate so not the greatest environment for mbas right now okay and and what do interest rates look like in india versus in the us so the Indian rates are comparably a little less by one or two percent. Again, it depends if you are going in with a co-signer or not in with the US lender, but they're in the double digits now. Essentially, at least my friends are facing double digits. I'm close to double digits. So I don't have the exact number because it's like floating and it's like changing. But yeah, there have been better times. So like I feel. Okay, got it. And and how long is the payback period? I'm not the right person for that because I don't know. It might be two, it might be four, it might be five. But I think it's usually in that ballpark of three to five. At least what I've heard from colleagues who've graduated, seniors and such. But yeah, ask me how in a couple of years and then I can give you a better answer. Okay, fair, fair. No, that's super helpful, Vivek. And also prior to joining business school, were there any pre-MBA internship opportunities that you considered? And do you know if a pre-MBA internship opportunities are available to raw students? I don't think it's a school specific. I think it's just up to the candidate to explore any space that they want to explore before an MBA. Honestly, I don't think it moves a needle at all. A McKinsey is not going to just come in for you just because you have like a one month or two month pre-MBA consulting experience. Experience. If they're interested in you, then they're already interested in you even without that experience. So I don't think it moves the needle at all. But what it does, it gives the, the student an insight into how the industry works. So if someone wants to get into tech, they want to be a PM, but they've never been a PM and they're working in some tech firm for like one, two months as a pre-MBA intern, then they know if that is a space they really want to get into. I think it just gives that additional light to their career choices in the short term. I think that's what it's helpful for. Otherwise, it doesn't move the needle on the resume for any firm. But I did do similar pre-MBA experience with one client in Italy. They were uh, looking into circular management economy and such. So it's also my first exposure to consulting. So I was able to understand how the industry works, speak to a couple of senior leaders, uh, what to expect if I get into this industry. So it helped me in that aspect. Like I knew, okay, I would be comfortable in this space and it's not something I would really struggle with because you're not learning any hard skills in like one, two months, which will significantly change your resume anyway. It's more of the softer side. Understood. Vivek, you talked about how Michigan is a sporting school. You know, there's the sporting culture is really big. Can you tell us a little bit about attending games at the big house? What's the experience like? You know, make it more real for us, perhaps. So I would suggest anyone listening to this to imagine sitting between 110,000 people who are, half of them are drunk. Half of them are not drunk, but act drunk. But it's like 110,000 or 1 lakh people all together in one space singing the same song, cheering the same team, wearing the same color. It is absolutely euphoric. And this is one of the experiences I wanted to get, which is why a big reason for me to choose Ross, because in India, we don't have these school experiences much as in pitted school against school or, or you know, pitted university against university to such an extent. Or you've got like 4,000, 5,000 or whatnot students in your university and you're like competing against each other in different intercollegial events. But this is a level of its own because it's religion for a few people in America. American football and I had to get used to the fact that I was still referring to football as football and people would get confused because I was a big fan of European football and it's been a great experience not playing but technically learning the sport it helps me with just speaking to people gives me like a two three minutes point of networking or conversation I also enjoy the sport at the same time every team especially Michigan is a really really strong in this almost like CSK and IPL in that aspect here so it's like really strong and we play one match every week of 
of which like so seven of your weekends are involved with matches happening in Ann Arbor and the stadium is just 100 meters or 100 meters from my place now where I'm giving this call so if I get out of my house now the stadium's right in front of me so I can even though I'm not going to the match I'm still part part of the hustle and bustle because suddenly out of nowhere 100,000 people will descend into the town like every other day I'm thinking where are the people in this town like are people even living here and suddenly during the day of the match is like one lakh people so it's absolutely crazy this is where I try to get acclimatized to the American way of life where there's a lot of things called tailgating and everything is quite common here can you talk about what tailgating is yeah so tailgating for those who don't know started off when people used to follow teams that they supported so they used to go to the venue park their cars outside open up their trucks the f150 trucks or what not put grills barbecue and drink and camps some people even put up TVs there and just they don't go into the stadium but they sit outside and have like a fun party US B schools took that to the next extent especially Michigan took that to the next extent so you're going to find alums and normal citizens of the city from Detroit from other Chicago and etc coming in to watch the match everyone buying selling stuff here and there hot dogs and everything it's like a whole exhibition or it's like actual fun it's so much fun to be a part of it even if you're not going to the match and then Ross has a very unique tradition where we call it the bus where it's just a bus it's like a double decker bus the bus is not active to be driven around but it just sits in one parking lot and it's managed by a group of students a group of friends that we have and it's called tailgating or our version of tailgating is the ross bus where there's like 100 students for every match surrounding the bus and just it's like this fun is beer everywhere drinks everywhere music everywhere it's just like a really 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 fun time and one of the US piece of the Ross experience outside academics. Yeah, it's it's a really absolutely crazy experience this being part of the stadium, being in the crowd and you can see this culture in permeating in all aspects of the school as well. Where I mentioned previously that there's a lot more we and what people look out in each other. There's a lot more collaboration between other schools than you don't see in most other top B schools where there's so many intermixing happening between students from different graduate schools and the business school for example. So, I think that permeates across the town across the city across the school for us very nice yeah, yeah you speak about football being a religion reminds me of my cousin big fan as well and he was scheduled to go to ireland for his 50th birthday with his family and michigan made it to the finals or the playoffs and and then he cancelled the trip and they went for <laughs> instead the entire family and they were like totally worth it yeah it is and firstly you're thinking oh i'm coming from a country which plays cricket maybe next is hockey people usually of my generation follow football as well and the other sports and suddenly coming in and thinking oh what sort of sport is this and you get sucked into the cult it's a proper cult i'm telling you everyone is like sporting mm zms if i show you my t-shirt right now it has like an m yeah everyone's part of the cult once you're a part of michigan go blue yes i say it in the positive sense as well not in the negative aspect of the cult much more easier to speak with alums from any school i doesn't need to be a business school alum i can speak to a liberal arts alum from 10 15 years ago they'll still connect with you or at least most of times the hit rate is really high in that aspect for us okay so oh, that's wonderful as well and we talked about detroit and like the people from the town descending on when there is games but also love to get a better sense for what living in ann arbor looks like and how does that shape your mba experience if you could talk about that a little yes so i was Was really particular that I did not want to go to the one of the big cities for my MBAs. That was reflective in the schools I chose as well. So my reasoning was that if you're in a New York or a Chicago, then your experiences in the day would be related to the town or related to the city rather than about the university. So. let's say you want to hang out with a friend domestic student let's say from america but they'll have friends in new york they'll have friends in chicago so how much of their time can they contribute towards the school itself then? that's limited and even i would be limited that way i was particular that i did not want to go to such a city and there's quite a few b schools if there's students or who's people who are viewing this video who have similar mindset or similar rational like me then there are a few schools there's yale which is in new haven there's i believe kellogg which is in evanston and people yeah. still go to chicago but tuck as well tuck is even more isolated than Michigan is there's a few schools and the difference actually comes out because Tuck is also a school because of its isolated aspect is really strong in their community much much more than the other schools 
Ross is really similar that way because you're spending more of your time with your colleague or with your friend in the context of the university rather than spending with your friend you knew since 15 years in Chicago. So the time commitment varies that way psychologically, which is one of the reasons I went with Michigan and Ann Arbor. This Ann Arbor has like, I think, 500,000 people as a population is really close to Detroit, half an hour away. It's one of the big cities. We are three hours away from Chicago. Again, one of the biggest financial hubs in America. Just taking another step here, Michigan is really, really beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. I've gone up till the boundary of US and Canada, just driving across eight, nine hours in the peak of the fall season. And it was absolutely stunning. So there's so much to explore. So you you still get that attachment to the nature and the environment, but you're still at touching distance from proper industrialized cities. The only difference is that it's much more comfortable if you have a car. That's the thing, again, people have to get used to when they move from India. It's not like walking distance, everything. Like if you're hungry at 11 o'clock or 11 p.m., you can't just go down and get a snack from one of the stalls that we usually have in India. That's, that's absolutely not the case. And I think that is more consistent across all the cities in America, except New York, maybe. I guess New York is the only city, I think, which is open like 24 hours and every the city closes down by eight or nine. Ann Arbor is the same, but the student population is so strong here that it's still lively. The downtown is still lively. The houses are still lively. People just sit on their lawn and just have their stuff going on, have parties or drinks or whatnot. So that is the Ann Arbor part of it. Right now, it's supposed to get cold. So like we had snowfall a week ago, a couple of weeks ago for like three, four days. And now it's again quite sunny. It's showing 60 degrees Fahrenheit, which should be approximately 20 degrees Celsius. This is like December. So this is like heaven for people here in the winter if they get this temperature. But we're going to get snowfall, three or four snowfalls again till like March. We have to like brace for that, which is fine because the day it snows, it's really beautiful. The next day it gets really dirty and muddy, but the day it snows again, it's absolutely beautiful. Yeah. What else can I add in the aspect of Ann Arbor? I'm happy to answer more. Yeah, this is really helpful. Provide some color and would love to understand in terms of housing, where do raw students generally live? How far away? from school as well as maybe what the food and beverage scene looks like going out you know do the bars etc what time do they shut down you know a little bit what are some of the favorites there are like four or five strong options for students who come in housing options student buildings and residencies and most students split themselves or distribute themselves across these four or five options and there's usually at max one and a half to two miles from school what are they called so it's roughly like three kilometers at max the radius so it's still comfortable to walk if you're comfortable with a 30 minute walk every day but they're called a yard and woodbury and 618 so yeah it's more like just names given to these buildings but people just distribute themselves across these four or five places which again speaks to why i didn't go to the bigger cities because you can be much more spaced out if you're in that in, in a bigger city and of course outside these four or five options you can still go forward and just stay in rent and just any other house like we do it in india that is an option as well and there are a lot of options here so it's largely around a two to three kilometer radius comfortable walking around should take 30 to 40 minutes if you're walking from one your place at max to someone else or a friend who's living at the diametrically opposite place in the city. The food and beverage scene is largely American style. There are a few favorites for students which are a little more Caribbean. There are a few Indian favorites as well. More than Indians, I see always Latinos and Americans going to this Indian restaurants more than Indians do. So it's clearly a favorite for them. Michigan is a big pizza hub. That is where most of the companies started off from. Domino's, etc. And a lot more American brands started off from Michigan. So pizza is a big thing here. But other than that, I think we can find all cuisines. Maybe if you want a niche cuisine like Peruvian cuisine, you might find just one or two restaurants. But if you are Indian, going for Indian, you have like five or six options. American, you always have options because everyone serves beer and burger is that the staple food here and yeah I, I think it can be much much better at least on par with chicago and such but it's more reflective of the size so it's more limited but if you're comfortable driving 20 30 minutes there's like really really amazing uh, places which have more middle eastern population living there more arabic population living there so called dearborn and lansing etc they're like 20 minutes driving distance and they have some of the best middle eastern restaurants in america so it takes a little effort to go there 
every day but there are a few hot spots and hits all around us here okay and maybe name three of your favorite restaurants it depends on the situation if i'm like really really hungover and such there is like a diner called the forgetting that there's a diner i don't know how i'm blanking out on this it's an american diner you're always hungover when you go there (laughs) (laughs) so i'm 27 but i feel uh, my body is not taking all this anymore so I'm trying to really cut down. <laughs> I feel I'm supposed to be young, but I feel much more older compared to my colleagues. Yeah, there's this diner. I'm just blacking out on that. But there's another space called Bill's Beer Garden, which has outdoor seating and it's like full of students, especially during the summer and the fall. It closes during the winter. There is this place called Frita Batidos, which is a very Cuban cuisine, very Cuban-centric dishes. Again, a really big hit. There is this place called Madras Masala, which is really popular with Indians and anyone who goes for Indian food. It's closer to the food we eat at home. If you take an average of all the food preferences across India, it's more closer to that average. Yeah, these three would be the hits. And again, I'm forgetting the diner, but uh, that's a great place as well. Okay, fair. Vivek, I want to talk about one of the flagship experiences at Ross, which is the map. I'd love for you to share a little bit about your map experience and how it has helped you in your professional endeavors already. Yeah, so map is called multi-action discipline project is two month activity where instead of you're not pursuing any other subjects there in the space of the six weeks and you're like working as a pro bono consultant to one of the firms again one of the usps which pulled me to ross because i was more into experiential learning which ross is all about and i was like this is going to be a great starter pack before i get into my internship so i did that i mean everyone has to do that so i didn't have a choice but you can give your preferences for which kinds of projects you want to do and you get a list of projects and you can like prioritize them rank them. So I was able to do my project in Ghana for like two months. So I was based out of Ghana, the capital city of Accra for like two weeks, all sponsored, working closely with our clients and their customers also who are based out of Ghana. So it was a very interesting space in the energy industry. It was more into energy credits and renewable energy credits, a space which is still not still in a very, very nascent age now. So that was quite interesting. Um, So I'd spend that for like six weeks. Different teams had different experiences like a few worked out of UK a few worked out of Uganda there were a couple of teams based out of India who were working with the Tatas there were a couple of again in India who were working with the government on ONDC the platform which is coming up on behalf of the government Um, you do have international exposure as well if you prefer that so you can prioritize them Uh, you get options to do your project in usually Africa Asia Asia when I say it's usually India complete Africa Europe South America and you can also just stay back and do it in different cities of America as well. So that's an option many students also took up. And the nature of the projects varies from each project. But yeah, it's overall a really, really great experience. I think some of the two of the best months or the most impactful months that most MBAs at Ross usually go through. Very nice. And you mentioned that you have some choice in the project that you pick. Yeah, you can rank and prioritize them. Yes. Okay, that's cool. Would also love to hear a little bit about Mtrek, how it works and what your experience was like? Mtrek is this trek which you take up for like one week just before your classes start. When I say it's a trek, it's more like a vacation or a getaway to one of the places, again, which you can prioritize and like rank. So the options are usually different cities in America, or different national parks or different states. A few options are also in Southern America. A few options are in Central America. A few options are in Europe. Asia is a little difficult because of the distance required to travel. It takes up a lot of time if you're just have one week but it's usually limited to Europe and maybe a few countries in Africa and then largely North and Southern America so you can choose to go for this getaway before your classes start I took it up and I wanted to do this because I felt this would be a nice introduction to my life in school I would get comfortable speaking to people I would get comfortable with different elements that I was not exposed to previously and also it's a great opportunity to explore a country as well so my first M track was in Panama where we this country is a Central American country and we were there for like a week. A bunch of 15 to 18 people, mix of MBA 1s, 2s and 3s. So when I say MBA 3s, it's usually the ones who do dual degrees. So mix of all of us and it was a great experience. I think it made me really much more comfortable when I started off, actually started off my classes. I wanted to lead one this year to Bolivia, but it turned out to be too expensive for any student. So we were like, okay, let's not do that. But that would have been great if we ended up with it. So instead, I went up to this state of Washington, which has some of the best 
national parks in US. So we went around there driving, camping with the MBA one. So it was a great experience that way as well. So it was a mix for me, international first year, national second year. And both the time it was an amazing experience. But again, it's an option open to everyone. And if you're coming in with a partner, even your partner, if they're not MBA student, you can still join as a plus one for your MTrack. Understood. And if someone's trying to be frugal and considering skipping MTrack, what would you say to them? I think that's completely fine. Best not to overthink things in MBA because there'll always be something else to overthink about. So if you don't want to do it, don't do it. Rather, you can do something at one tenth cheaper option and still have the same amount of experiences near your home or where you're staying. So I think we should all be comfortable with it. And I would actually advise students to first consider that before they even consider doing any other trek. Okay, fair. In terms of academics, can you speak a little bit about your favorite professors and also the most popular electives at Ross? So one of my favorite professors and favorite courses is called the Leadership and Crisis. It's taken by Professor Mike Bajer and he was one of the founding members of the airline company JetBlue and he's a faculty here. So essentially your class gets divided into six different teams and every week one team plays the role of C-suit of one company and every week you go through one crisis as a company and you hold a town hall and you like take questions from angry stakeholders, etc. It's like a simulation and it's one of my favorite classes here. Still another week to go but I think every week fantastic learning because not only you're able to go through a simulation like that but you're also able to speak to the visiting executive from each company who comes to visit. And then you can see the difference in how you are responding as a leader and how an ideally a leader does respond in such a crisis. So you'll have visiting CSU leaders from Amex, JetBlue, etc. coming in. So it's one of the best courses here. It requires a high bid to get in. And yeah, I'm happy I've gotten that course. But otherwise, all the electives are really fantastic. The bidding goes quite high because as I've told you that there is a lot more intermingling between schools here. So some of the law courses are really, really exceptional. If someone's interested in dabbling a bit into law, you can still take one or two courses, IP law and such, which I've heard is like, fantastic. I didn't go forward with that experience, but might do it next semester. The marketing courses as well are always highly bidded as well. The foundational courses of marketing are also exceptionally good. And the strategy courses again are exceptionally good. The technology courses are good, but they're also really dense. So you got to be comfortable with that aspect if you're taking it up. But I think all across the board, they're like fantastic courses. But for me, the one I mentioned about, I think that really stands out. Understood. Any other rock star professor you'd like to mention? There is John Branch, who I really enjoyed for marketing, at least. Really, really made marketing so much, so much fun. I don't want to do a disservice to any professor if they're watching this or what not. But I had a great experience all across. Fair. All right, Vivek, switching gears, I also want to talk about recruiting. Could you share a little bit about your recruiting journey and what enabled you to succeed in landing an internship with LEK? When I came in classes 2022, recruiting was getting difficult. That is when signs were showing that this is not going to be a great time for economy and recruiting. First impact of that was that it was difficult for anyone to pivot. Previously, if you're coming in from a completely different background and you want to pivot into consulting or tech, it was much more easier. People are much more open. There were much more open positions, a lot less competition. But from 2022 onwards, it became difficult. And it was reflective in all the schools and all the students I at least all the friends I have in other schools as well it's pretty much across the board which is why I said it does not matter if you go a college a school down your priority because experiences are still largely the same you can't go wrong with any of the choices this was one of my rationale behind saying that statement as well the economy was going being difficult it was tough to pivot companies were cutting down on the number of intern they would take they were being much more targeted they wanted less pivots in their candidacy or the applicants who are coming up rather ready-made people who had experience in consulting would be better fits for consulting. So that was more of the mindset. So it was not easy for anyone in the school because the class of 2023 had like a fantastic internship and full-time experience. So everyone thought it would be the same, but I think reality hit for us. It became a little difficult. People had to be more considerate about what their plan Bs were. If you're not getting into tech, what should you also look into? If you're not getting into IB, what should you also look into? I think that is when we had to be really more open about it. I did get in a few interviews, but finally I chose LEA Consulting because it was one of the top tier firms. I had a great experience speaking with them. 
and i really feel that i've come across after it i'm a much better consultant consultant than when i entered in the space of two months so great experience that way but it was not easy as in you have to maintain your sanity you have to be patient have a good support system of your friends mba ones mba twos if possible family and i would say people should be more comfortable about it now because i'm also going on linkedin right now and i see all these posts about recruiting at isb and some blah blah about it that some newspaper wrote about it and people are like giving a pros and cons of that article that recruiting in india is bad now but it's the same story everywhere as in you have to be comfortable that when you're coming to an mba you're not guaranteed a job but you have to maintain your sanity hopefully everyone comes out all right in the end but it's not an easy process at least last year this year and for the next couple of years so you have to be ready for that it's it's almost like version of the 2008 crisis where now it's not just financial but you also got the technology improvements coming in so companies can optimize their they don't need to take so many intake like they previously did financially their interest rates are difficult so they can't go forward and vouch for bigger projects so it's a multitude of different factors yeah shaping up the space right now understood sort of like a tactical question about recruiting itself do students need to fly out to cities to network with consulting firms or are the consulting firm representatives all coming to Ann Arbor? Right now, it's all largely virtual, not just for Ann Arbor, but for most schools. But for IB, especially, you would have to fly out for investment banking if you're recruiting for it. There's an expectation that you should be ready to actually fly out and attend these events. For consulting, it is usually in the final stages when you're like, you've got an interview invite or when you're really close to making the cut, that is when you might expect some experience like this, but it varies from firm varies office to office yeah it is part of the recruiting experience yes okay understood and vivek could you very quickly give a sense for how many indians are in your batch and then like let's say if there's x how many went to consulting versus tech versus banking could you give us a sense for that yeah so um, i would say roughly 10 to 12 percent of my cohort are indians or people who hold indian passports how many would that be roughly 40 45 so indians indians because people tend to get into a tendency of confusing the indian origin students as indian as well that's not the case so it's usually 40 45 it's the same this year as well in the new intake that i'm seeing for us at least in the internship cycle seven or eight students got into ib investment banking there were approximately 20 to 25 i think who got into consulting maybe maybe in the lower end of that so maybe around 20 i think 20 28 another eight or so got into tech and the remaining uh, seven to ten got into corporate strategy roles business development corporate strategy roles what kind of employers are those with the corp strategy roles? It's usually like a Visa or an IBM or a Cummins or, or a Dell. Okay, and they all recruit full-time as well. They sponsor visas. Yes. Okay, understood. And and who are the top employers among consulting firms? Apart from MBBs, are there any other big ones? You can't call them as big because they usually take like just three, four from the school every year. So they're not big, big. But if four is a big number in context, then all the non-MBBs do take in those many students. So Tani, so the Alex Partners, or the LEKs, or the Rollenbergers, the EYPs, or the Strategy Hands. I think there's a list of like 10 or so non-MBB companies and all of them take Two to four. It varies, but two to four. Yeah. Understood. And what about among tech companies? Who are the big employers there, apart from Amazon? The tech companies are usually Microsoft, Google. They did cut down this year across the board. Amazon cut down as well, but usually traditionally they've been the biggest. Then there's Adobe's as well. Then there's Intuit's, Adobe's, Nvidia's. So not as in I'm not able to recollect because I didn't go for tech. But outside the fangs, there is still a good amount of companies which go for tech students. Uh, and students who are interested in uh, the tech industry. The last one I remember was TikTok. TikTok was there as well. That's one I can immediately recollect. But yeah, it's a good mix, I would say. But Amazon has traditionally been the hub for Michigan. Yeah. Okay, understood. And you talked about the difficult recruiting environment, right? So in light of that, what have re- return offers been like? Have, have companies held back on return offers and are students mostly recruiting? 
or how do things look yeah i think the situation this year and the same across most schools or all the schools is that the return offers have been cut down a bit usually it was hovering i guess in the 90s and now it's like 70% or something and some companies especially tech companies are holding back on finalizing anything until they get to the new year so it's wait and watch process for most of the companies and most of the students waiting for the federal bank here to like make some changes the interest rates and that's going to immediately reflect in some openings hopefully for next year but yeah i think that's pretty much what i've seen at least in all the people i'm speaking to in other schools as well also yeah okay understood vivek is there anything else about ross that you would want our audience to know i would say that you should try to look into the clubs as well which are interested when you're looking into ross be a contributor to a club where in a capacity where you're as an part of the theater and the follies club where i perform skits and role plays just yesterday i performed a mime as well at ross be part of a club where you can provide in a non intellectual capacity where you're growing in that way as well so it's more of like a distraction for you from the hustle and bustle of everyday look into clubs where you want to take leadership roles as well i was grateful enough to do that with one of the clubs so there's also different elements of ross or stood out for me such as this podcast which students can be a part of podcast and we release that on spotify and other platforms so i was able to not just listen to that before i joined ross but i was also able to be a part of it and actually yeah have this conversation with similar folks from at ross as well on different areas of it so it's called the business beyond usual podcast there's this really innovative program called open road again that was right after map and before internship for me so i didn't go back to india because i wanted to do open road that was a choice i took in the summer where you are given the opportunity to do a road trip around america any city of your choice uh, in a group of four and work with one company in one week in one city and that was one of my favorite experiences at all so far because i was driving around 3000 4000 kilometers for the first time in america on my own with a couple of co drivers as well but it was a great experience which like completely acclimatized me to it i was able to go into cities which traditionally you wouldn't go as a tourist or as a student so i was able to get out of the mba bubble get to know the actual people of america so as in what you see in mba is not representative of the entire country so able to experience that work with startups that was fantastic so yeah great experience one of the stand out experiences again for me as i mentioned i wanted to put my fingers in a lot of pies in the first year but i knew what i wanted to really really be a part of and these are a few areas which i did okay that's wonderful the open road does sound fantastic and a very unusual experience do students pursue in semester internships as well yeah they do are they mostly virtual or are they in an hour mostly virtual okay but- companies are also much more comfortable with it now what kind of roles might they be in it might be an analyst role or in some capacity in a pvc firm we are helping them i don't know like their pitch startup? books or such could it be like a yes, tech certainly. startup yes. or something like that yes Yes and you can do these through courses as well even in some courses at Ross you can work with startups directly and I'm going to do a similar course next semester where I'm going to be attached to one startup and I'm going to work with the CEO or the C suite of their startup for like 2 3 months essentially 4 months not 2 3 months so you have opportunities that way as well through Ross and you've got this foundation called the ZLI or the Zelluri Institute which like pushes for more startups startup funding startup interactions interactions promoting uh, the startup environment in atros and such so through these mediums you get the opportunity to work directly with them through your courses but you can also do internships outside the school as well okay that's great and nice to hear that international students are eligible for such opportunities yes uh, yeah, not so straightforward but it is possible yes like oh, you have okay. to jump through a few hoops and hurdles as it usually is in america but i think people will usually get through it yeah okay amazing i am conscious that we're out of time as well and you've been gracious enough to extend so i really appreciate you doing that vivek thank you so much you've been really gracious in sharing a wealth of information thank you so much i'm sure our listeners will find this really helpful <laughs> Thank you.